Wow, this has been such a rich conversation so far. Um, one question we would love to hear from y'all, and unfortunately these responses will have to be a little shorter because we're almost out of time. Um, but what qualities of abolition work would you say aren't showing up in, co in the cooperative space and vice versa? Can I? Oh, go for can, it. Can I jump in with, because it kind of bridges to what is showing up and what isn't showing up. And sometimes yeah. they're the same thing because yeah. co-ops aren't a monolith. Like some of <laughs> us are a decade ahead of what other of us are still catching up about. Um, and, and I think it bridges to this question of like, all right, what's up? What's up? How can co-ops help with abolition? Um, so I will bridge that by saying first, I think um, there are some pretty direct and material things around just like what is your cooperative business plan that could or should meet the needs um, of, of people people who are survivors, because that's a huge part of the carceral system is like the way that that gets weaponized often, but also just like that that's a need. If we're envisioning a world without prisons, we got to talk about the people who are the survivors of harm, um, but certainly also the people who've caused harm. Um, and all the bystanders, which like often gets left out of the conversation. And I, I've only learned this like, you know, 10 years into doing, um, well now, 15 years into doing this work more and more that like we got to zoom out and start considering like there's all these people who are like yo i'm activated in this now because like now i have a feeling about like you stole her such and such and so like now i feel less safe or now i feel like i gotta lock my stuff up or i feel like you're not listening to my voice unless you're adhering to my demand that this person is chased out of town and blah blah, blah right so we have some stuff to do um there's some things we can be doing there's there are cooperatives right now um, in many of the places you live that uh, provide safer spaces, that deal with mental health, that deal with spiritual health, that deal with physical health. I mean, yoga, acupuncture, uh, herbalism, like all kinds of things, uh, fitness centers, many of them are, are actually offering um, free or discounted participation in their, their programs or their services, um, just in solidarity with Black and Indigenous people. Um, and I think certainly could or should consider being like, oh, you're formerly incarcerated, free coffee, free whatever. Like that there's way, there are ways that we can just bake that into our plan and show our politics um, in that way. Uh, I think that ties to mutual aid as a higher principle of something that we're already really good at. And we saw this in like in stereo, um, especially in the spring in March, April, May, um, in light of the pandemic where people were like, normally we run a bookstore. Now we're a food hub because people ain't got food and they're not leaving the, na the immediate neighborhood. Like this is what we're living with. So we fully have, and that's just the existing capital, not even speaking to what is the cooperative uh, network that we're building that's like in the pipeline that's under development and that needs to be resourced when we talk about divestment and reinvestment. Um, so all of those things are there. Um, one more macro thing and then a like cultural thing. The macro thing when we talk about defunding the police, um, abolishing the carceral state. Um, and it was like so joyous to see the level of sophistication where we finally saw people who I'm sure self-identified as allies move through a moment of being like, oh, there's a, this many billions of dollars that we're paying into the active harm of our own people. And we could literally be like, oh, there are 12 people on this city council, or there's this many people at the county or the state level. We can take those that money and just the same thing that we're actively replenishing year after year and move it into the things that we need to feed ourselves, to house our people, to clothe our people, let alone the social services, the mental health services, when it gets down to it, let's talk, let's map out like where, where is incarceration even coming from? What are we locking people up for? Half of this stuff shouldn't be cr criminalized in the first place. So it's really helpful to say, yeah, show up at the polls, turn out the vote, maybe not because of a candidate for president or for senator, but literally there are ballot initiatives all up and down in all the places y'all live that are like community oversight board for the police, defunding them, setting up these kinds of commissions. What does it look like to reinvest in some of these community um, councils and uh, mental health services and recognizing that so many of the folks that are in harm's way and or who get locked up and swept up in the system, it's because we're not funding our goddamn schools. It's because we don't have any mental health services. It's also because our own communities 
don't have a level of cultural tolerance for people who are problematic in one way or another. So it gets right back at the like, if we're talking about abolition, it means like, yeah, we have to have a little more nuance than being like, you're either canceled or you're woke. It's like people cause harm all the time. And I think that is one of the lessons that we can show in cooperatives, which is like, you're an owner, you're a co-owner of a business. Sorry that I'm like overly attributing this to worker cooperatives, but like that's my political home nowadays. <laughs> I've been involved in all kinds of other cooperatives and I'm like, this is the, this is the, the special sauce. You're unprincipled. You did this thing. Like it doesn't mean that you're going to agree all the time to Ed's point. Like it's not now you got a co-op, there's democracy. It's the solution. It's like, no, no, no. When you get in there, you realize, oh yeah, you're in this and you're disagreeing with people. What does it mean to disagree with folks? It means that like we have figured out processes, a culture, mechanisms for being in principle disagreement with each other. And sometimes the stretch of that is not just disagreement like you think we should invest in a new walk-in fridge and you think that we should spend our money in raising wages or whatever. Sometimes it's actively like this dude caused harm. <laughs> Like my people don't feel safe or so-and-so said something that is not in alignment with our movement principles. And we don't think that they should be in our space or that they should be representative um, of our movements. How do you grapple with that without just being like you're banished and excommunicated? That's the work that we did in Philly stands up. That's why we pivoted from being necessarily doing like the active conflict, you know, harm reduction stuff to doing ed political education around transformative justice. I mean, just like gorgeous things that are coming out of, op-eds in the New York Times from our homie Mariam Kaba, from people who are, you know, getting into this, the work of what it really looks like to hold people accountable in a way that has nothing to do with litigators, uh, arbitration, judges, courts, certainly not cops, police, and prisons, to actually deal with the source of the harm. And it means that we're returning to indigenous practices of not kicking people out. So it's taking the principle of restorative justice that I think already exists in basically all cooperatives and amping that all the way up to transformative justice, which is zooming out and saying, what are all of the things about the circumstances and situation that need to be changed, including our social relationships? And that's where I think we're, we, are not, we are not the model or the example, but we have a structure and an institution that's binding us together, where we have to make collective decisions, where we have a certain amount of trust, and where I think we could start to show the way of what it looks like to, hold, to principally hold people accountable for their harm and address it. Um, that's good. You're going to see that in schools. You're going to see that in um, sometimes in nonprofits, in all kinds of different institutions, collectives um, that aren't even incorporated and structured are already doing this. So all of those, I think, start to show the way of what it looks like to take skills of group governance, not just around like harm or accountability, but even lighter things of like, how do you make collective decisions? What does accountability look like? Not because you caused harm, but like because you forgot to lock the front, like just basic things. Like what are the things you were meant to do? Co-ops are very practiced in this stuff. Very, very practiced in that stuff. And I think that we should be sharing those skills with our, with our community members. Yes, um, would love to hear from you, Morningstar, if you have anything you want to add or um, kind of pick up from there. Yeah, all of that was great. I would just add, you know, that in, um, in utilizing decolonization and autonomy um, as, you know, as, as these forms of of tearing down these carceral systems. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's a legacy of resistance that has, that's been my, my personal model that has been um, just my lived experience. I do want to acknowledge and recognize there's, there's an elder on the call here this evening, um, Urban Res Life. Urban Res Life was a child um, on Alcatraz Island during the occupation over 50 years ago. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that and, and just say that, um, you know, in recognizing when, when I think of abolition, you know, 
it's just like the picture that I have in my mind is, is this island of Alcatraz and how Alcatraz was this former prison and how the native peoples that occupied Alcatraz um, were able to transform it and to say like, yes, there's this history of confinement and our own peoples being confined on the island, but to transform it into recognizing the lack of running water, the lack of heat, the lack of um, employment on the island was very much modeled after US reservations. And so they made that stand, that 19 month stand and in occupying the island and they created a school on the island. The educators created a school called the Little Red Schoolhouse. And that schoolhouse was one that I attended as a child and that my children then attended after I did. And so I just think of these models and this reimagining of everything that Esteban just, just mentioned and, and Ed and Jessica as well. And, and just thinking of like, what is possible and what is it that um, we are recreating and absolutely in addressing harm within our communities um, addressing, you know, the centering of survivors in, in all of this and recognizing that, um, that we were over, we've overcome a lot of trauma in that, and that, um, you know, we are figuring it out as we go in terms of healing ourselves individually and healing our communities collectively. Um, I just want to say very briefly, uh, the cooperative movement is again, it's an arena of struggle that contains all of the problems and all of the virtues uh, of any other arena. And so, you know, we live in a racist society. So you have racism inside cooperatives. Uh, we live in, in a individualistic capitalist oriented society. You have tendencies toward that inside cooperatives. Where cooperatives are different is that they, they do not elevate to the level of principle um, the elevation of profit over human life. Um, and they do make meeting needs something that is central to a group of people getting together to collectively do so. All of the different kinds of ways we can mess that up, we do. And we have to, it's an ongoing and continuous struggle to find ways to do it right. But at least we're trying to do the right thing. And we have to continue to do that. And again, in building this world in which prisons are not, um, are not thought to be needed. I believe they're not needed now, but they're thought to be needed. But in building a world where they're not thought to be needed and where people have a, a, an opportunity to full expression of their humanity, their creativity, their energy, um, without doing anything that's gonna land them in a place where they're locked away from society. In building that, we have much to learn from the effort that we're putting into the cooperative system, even though again, much of it suffers from the same struggles that we suffer from in all the other arenas. Yeah, let me just add, um, this is a fabulous conversation. Um, I wanted to add on both sides. So what I think, you know, the cooperative movement can actually learn from the abolitionist movement is a couple things. Um, one is the insidiousness of anti-blackness and then and the need to address, you know, to address and eliminate, ab abolish anti-blackness, right? Um, the abolitionist movement forces us to remember that and to remember, right, as we said, that even the 13th Amendment, which abolished enslavement, didn't really abolish racism. It didn't abolish incarceration or, in, or slavery during incarceration, any of those kinds of things. I think another thing that we, um, we all learn, and especially the, the co-op community can also learn, um, from abolition is the notion of state violence, right? And to understand structural systemic problems, issues, uh, violence and inequality. Because also it's really easy to focus on behavior and individual people doing something or not doing something. And even again, co-ops suffer from doing that, focusing more on the individual, even though, right, we're supposed to be a collective and whatever. Um, the abolitionist movement helps us to remember, right, that people's individual behavior is just a tiny little piece of what's going on. It's really the structural systemic um, 
systems in our society that you know that are that need to be addressed and and that we can't solve the problems of society without looking and solving those um Esteban brought up, um, I think he didn't name it victimization, but the victimization movement, which I believe has also come out of the abolitionist movement. My daughter actually is, an, is a, victim, a victimologist, meaning she studies uh, criminology and crime from the perspective of society as the victim. And what does that mean for restoration and problem solving uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's another thing that the abolitionist movement has, right? That's part of understanding state violence, right? That they're all, we're all actually victims, even the so-called criminals. And how do we address that? How do we reorganize and, re, you know, and restore ourselves from that perspective instead of blaming other people, right? Analyzing the systems. Um, so I think those kinds of things we get from abolition will help the co-op movement, but also just help all of us as human beings. As we all keep saying, even the co-op movement is really just to get us closer to human perfectibility, right? To, to achieving well-being and our humanness to the extent that we can, especially through economic systems. So even co-ops aren't the end all, the be all, whatever. Um, but on the other hand, I do wanna just mention quickly, cause I know we're ready for Q and A. Um, some of the research I've been doing about how um, allowing incarcerated people to form their own worker co-ops while still in prison is, an, to me, a move toward um, decarceration and, and abolition, right? Because it, it um, helps to put an end to slave labor, other indignities, and lack of control over income and control over work and control over product, right? That happens in prison as well as in our regular system. Um, and there's good results. Uh, Mekele prison in Ethiopia has been doing incredible stuff with um, incarcerated worker co-ops and connecting these co-ops with micro lending programs that are right on site, allowing even um, released uh, people uh, to stay in their co-op so they still have work and have a job and have that camaraderie once they're out. The camaraderie and the social capital and the leadership development that happens um, even while you're in prison, if we had more of them, would be a way, I think, to figure out how to change even what the nature of what prison is like, right? We know that um, the people that we've interviewed who have been in prisons, especially I, I, I had interviewed some people from the um, uh, Cooperative Aragos in Puerto Rico in one of the prisons there. And when they talk about the experience, right, of belonging, of making their own decisions, of working with other people, of making enough income to help their families, all that kind of thing really helps to transform what could happen and how we treat right, how we actually treat um, people behind bars. So I think there's that, um, oh, the give and take, not give and take, what is it, the exchange, right, that uh, abolition and co-op movement or the movement for a dignified work or whatever, right, there's ways that, there's so many ways that we can interface what we learn and what we know from each of those movements and come up with, a, you know, a really beautiful new system and future that we'd all be happy to be a part of and that would um, address all the issues that we've all been talking about and create some of the societies that I think um, we've been hearing from Morningstar about, right? Um, uh, the, how our ancestors have, have, have viewed and tried to, tried to create societies on a better way. <laughs>